Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. I am so excited for today's guest. We have Ari Weinswag of Zingerman's Deli uh, and the Zingerman's Community of Businesses. Ari, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Sean. It's a pleasure. Ari, uh, you know, we're so fortunate. Um, Toast, uh, our primary technology partner, they're the title sponsor of this show. They power the technology at our barbecue restaurants. They enable us to, to have guests on like you that have really made an impact in the hospitality business by doing things differently. You know, it's so hard in the hospitality business and the restaurant business Um to make it. <laughs> it's it's hard. It's hard to, you know, this show is for entrepreneur.com. Millions of people, uh, fortunately, will tune into this. Uh, it's so difficult to make it in this business, yet you have done things by going against the grain. Um, and I would love for you, first of all, to tell me uh, where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? I, I saw that you asked that, and I, I was like, I have no idea. Uh, my favorite stage or venue is sitting alone with a book, <laughs> preferably in the sun, probably like where you are in San Diego, not like where I am in Ann Arbor, where it's actually a remarkable 50 degrees in the middle of January, wow. end of December today, but, but Saturday was zero. So, but anyway, yeah, I, I, uh, that's probably one of my favorites. Uh, I guess if I had to pick something that's more attuned to what you're really asking, uh, I don't really know, but I'm just going to go with the ARC, which is the, uh, it's a nonprofit here. It's a folk club, uh, folk music. It's, it's the, it's the oldest, the longest continuously operating uh, folk club in the country it started in the sixties and they've moved four or five times. It started in a church basement, but it's a really nice small venue for good music. Beautiful. So we're going to go to the ARC and I'm going to, I know you've given keynotes all over the world. You've done them in Ann Arbor, 50,000 people. You've given it to Google. Um, you're a highly sought after uh, speaker, but we're going to go to this intimate ARC and we're going to bring the best of the best. So the hospitality professionals that truly want to level up, they want to change the way that they do business and um, by doing things differently, but we're going to give them you on center stage, but instead of telling us your backstory, which we will get into, I want to, I want you to tell us of your vision for the future. You've been in yeah. business for 40 years since 1982. Mm -hmm. um, you've done incredible things across multiple verticals, but um, we're talking about the food business and training business and hospitality business. But, but what are your plans for the next 10 years for Zingerman's? Well, it's, that's easy to answer because we already have our vision written conveniently wow. for 2032. So if you were to ask me in a week, it would be 2023. 20, I'd probably only be able to tell you nine years, but <laughs> uh, so we have a, we, one of the big pieces of how we work is by writing a vision and our sense of visioning, our, our, our beliefs about it. Uh, our approach to it is very different. I didn't go to business school, but it's very different than the more typical business school vision statement, of, which is a little short three or four line thing, which I still am not quite able to discern the difference between that and a mission statement. I like mission statements. Uh, in fact, I'm just by accident, ours is sitting over my shoulder on the wall up there. But but our, as we do vision, it's the story of the future. Uh written from the inside out so it's not a strategic plan that's how you get to the vision it's it's the story of how we want to exist how we want to be present in the world how we want to relate to each other to the community around us and how we hope the community relates to us etc at whatever point in time we pick so we wrote ours for 2032 uh it was we we do we use a very collaborative process so we had already been working on it for about a year and a half or two years really we were supposed to roll it out the last week of march uh 2020 after all this time of working so it wouldn't have been shocking because the way we worked everybody in the organization had seen multiple drafts by the time we would have got there but still it's important to go through the formal here's yep. the final one and of course that didn't happen uh, end of March 2020 we got a little bit diverted by I, what what happened there's something uh, happened something happened, something happened. But whatever global, it was global, it global event. Us, of course 
And uh, but we did roll it out with very minor grammatical improvements to the document uh, the following January. So that vision says a number of things. It's about 10 pages long. Uh, it's in the new pamphlet that I wrote, The Story of Visioning at Zingerman's, uh, which came out a few months ago, uh, if people are interested to see it. Um, but but anyway, in, in, a, in a synopsis, it outlines uh, many things. We'll continue to get better at our food quality, continue to improve our service, that our service will not just uh, with all due respect to Toast, not just to send, descend into data, but while we sure. focus on using the data that we and you all and everybody wants to use, that we also go in a totally opposite other th direction, which is kind of what you said, against the grain, uh, by really focusing on the reality that every human being is unique uh, and that we want to treat each, cust each guest uh, in a way that's appropriate for them on that day and to really make it make it special service it talks about uh our commitment to continue to open businesses only in this area so we're very focused not to judge others but very focused on only doing business in the community where we live uh it talks about uh continuing to do the transition work succession work uh which is appropriate we're getting out front of it by working on it ahead of time. So we we actually are finalizing the work on a perpetual trust. So I can talk about that if you want to. Uh, it talks about diversity work. It talks about inclusion work. They're not the same. They're important, two different things. It talks about uh, uh, starting to work, uh, which we haven't really done yet, but of starting to teach our leadership approaches, our business approaches to young people. So not the 16 year olds that we might hire, but to like teaching our visioning work to nine year olds, teaching our energy management work to eight year olds, teaching about beliefs. Uh, so that's a whole piece of work that we haven't really begun to do, but in 10 years we'll be doing it. Uh, it talks about obviously like you, the quality of workplace that we wanna be able to deliver to people. And then the last section is, is talks about love in the workplace, which if you would have told me in 1982, when we opened that I'd be writing about love in, in work, I'd be laugh. I would have laughed you out of the room, but I've come to believe that love is, uh, it's, 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 it's a natural byproduct of a healthy organizational ecosystem. That could be a family. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a band or a baseball team, and it could be a business. So when, when we're operating in harmony with nature, love is going to be present. And at the same time, each of us can choose uh, to bring love to every interaction that we we have. And it's not a made up thing. I really have come to understand how much it, it does impact the food. It does impact the guest experience. It does impact the way we treat each other if we choose to do that. So there's more, but that's a good synopsis. Well, I, I love the fact that you lead with love and that you talk about love. Um, you know, we're in the hospitality business and the service business and understanding how important it is that it takes a village you know no matter i I'm, I'm recording this here in san diego we have restaurants here in san diego you're in ann arbor i have new york city behind me no matter where you are on earth no matter where you consume this yeah. content whether you listen on audio whether you find it on youtube whether you find it on any of these platforms where it's available the most beautiful thing about what you're talking about in your village which is a big village in ann arbor is these mm -hmm. community of businesses this ecosystem mm -hmm. that you have built centered around love and centered around leadership of being open to discussing love. Can you bring us back to 1982 to the to the vision? Give people a little idea of of your backstory of of, of yeah. why the of how you how possibly did a historian get into the food business? Yeah. Well, I don't know if I ever made it to being a historian, but <laughs> I was a history you're, major. Although you're still maybe working now, on it. Now I'm a hist well, I don't know. It's, it's a made up name. But uh, so, yes, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I came to Ann Arbor to go to school at University of Michigan, like so many people do. Uh, I studied Russian history, to your point, and also anarchism. Uh, U of M has the largest anarchist collection in the country, is in the graduate library, and I used to go up there and study. Uh, after graduating with my history degree, of course, there isn't anything you could do with a history degree except go get more degrees, which is what I was supposed to do, but I wasn't quite ready for that. Uh, Mostly, uh, I and and we just talked about vision. When I graduated, I had no vision at all. Uh, I had only what David White, W H Y T E, the poet and writer whose books I would really recommend to people, calls the via negativa. Uh, 
it's where you're clueless about where you want to go, but you're really clear where you don't want to go. <laughs> I knew I didn't want to go home. Yeah. Uh, in order to not go home, I needed a job and I had driven a taxi part time you know, to pay my bills while I was in school, which was fine, but not that interesting. One of my college roommates was waiting tables at a restaurant in downtown Ann Arbor that's no longer there, but seemed like a good place to work. So I went in there and applied for a job as a server, which is what he was doing. They said they'd call me. I waited two weeks or so. They hadn't called me. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go back. I reapplied as a busboy. Once again, they said they'd call me. Clearly, the employment situation was quite different then than it is now. Uh, and uh, after another, whatever, two weeks, I was totally running out of money. So I went back and offered to do anything. They offered me a job washing dishes. I didn't know you weren't really supposed to want to wash dishes. So I just said, sure, all right, whatever. And uh, that's how I got started. So I would love to tell you this like great story like I hear from so many of my and your peers in the, in the industry, you know, that my mom was this incredible cook and we grew up surrounded by great food and I loved food and cooking and all these recipes are my mother's recipes. And for the time I was 10, I knew I was going to have my own place, but none of that is true at all. Uh, my mother was a good person and a teacher, but not a good cook. Uh, no one in my family was in business. So I don't even know you could go into business. It just like didn't even enter my mind. Uh, that that was an option. Uh, in fact, I, in hindsight, having studied and written about a whole book about beliefs, uh, I had very negative beliefs about business. They most It mostly seemed to do bad things to people, and I didn't really have a lot of interest in it. And and I just needed a job, you know, so I really lucked out because I stumbled into work that I still really love. I came to love food and cooking. I started prepping and line cooking and eventually managing kitchens. Uh, so my background in our world is all back of the house in its in its roots. Um, and uh, I stumbled into great people, too, because Paul Saginaw, who's been my partner in all this, which I just left a meeting with him uh, to come over here to do the podcast, uh, was the general manager. And he had been the bar manager at one of their other restaurants, and they had just promoted him and he had just moved over. So his first day as GM was my first day as dishwasher. Oh, and that's nice. how we met. And then uh, Frank Carollo, who retired uh, two years ago, although he's still working uh, at the Bakehouse, uh, who was our partner at, at Zingerman's Bakehouse for whatever, 20 something, 25 years, uh, more, 28 years, was a line cook. And then Maggie Bayless, uh, who we later, 10 years later, 15 years later, started Zing Train, which is our training business where I'm sitting right now, uh, was a cocktail waitress. So why we were all in there together, I don't know, but you know, we're now... 40 something years that we've known each other and have a lot of love and respect and we still like working together. So I feel incredibly fortunate for that. And, and I'll just say Paul relatively quickly changed my beliefs about business. Uh, so his dad was a dentist, but his grandfather had had a business in Detroit where Paul had grown up and he taught Paul what Paul taught me, which is that basically business is just a tool. It's neither good nor bad. It's, the issue is what you do with it. So in the same way, you could take a hammer and hit somebody in the head and cause them grave harm, or you could take the identical hammer and build a, a house, whatever, through Habitat for Humanity. It's the same hammer. And and that really helped quickly change my beliefs about business. And still really, it's it's sort of a course, what I've come to call a core story of of our organization. And it underlies still what we do. And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to share an exciting new offer from our sponsor, Atmosphere TV. Go to atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ to not only get Atmosphere TV for free, but also our audience is given the gift of $200 in ad credits, as well as free activation. Join more than 40,000 other venues who use Atmosphere TV by signing up with the code BBQ at atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ. Keep guests entertained with Atmosphere TV because you have the ability to turn your promotions and your advertisements onto your television with this platform. The simple plug and play device lets you take control of the content on your screens. Keep guests entertained, engaged, and informed of real-time specials, career opportunities, and announcements that you can personalize within your own custom content dashboard. Tap into great channels such as America's Funniest Home Videos, Fashion, Throttle, Chive TV, Sports Highlights, Red Bull, Real Madrid, along with unbiased news and entertainment. There is something for everyone. 
Over 60 curated channels of short form, entertaining content to choose from right at your fingertips. They also have an incredible ad supported network that allows you to not only market within your four walls, but also locally or nationally if you desire. The platform gives you full control to dial in your marketing efforts. Please go and visit atmosphere.tv slash BBQ and let them know restaurant influencers sent you. Can you uh, give our listeners and our viewers an idea of the of the scope and the scale of what you guys have built in 40 years? And I know you yeah. repeatedly yeah. said that growing for growth's sake isn't something that people should be doing, um, you know, just because you could have opened up a Zingerman's in every single university town and across the country you've been asked, you're probably pitched on a daily basis to continue to to grow. And that that wasn't your trajectory. In fact, you, yeah. you went antithesis to that. Can you uh, g- yeah, give us absolutely. an idea of the, of the scope? Yeah. And let me finish. I guess I didn't really finish the story of Zingerman. So I was working for other restaurants. So Paul left. I stayed and worked for that restaurant group for about four years. Paul left about halfway through that and opened a little fish market here in Ann Arbor, which is still one of the best in the country. And uh, he and I stayed friends. And, you know, as every and everybody, almost everybody in the industry who's paying attention thinks of opening their own place. Not everybody does, of course. But, you know, we would chat here and there about about doing something together and uh anyway fall of 1981 so a really long time ago ancient history uh shortly after world war ii uh, i i reached a point which people i'm sure many can relate to like i didn't hate going to work it was a perfectly fine company and it's what i would now call a good job but it wasn't good work good work meaning more the context of vocation which i would say I have now had for many decades but so I just decided you know what it's time to do something else like I didn't hate going in but it was just like I could sense where they were going wasn't where I wanted to go uh, and it was just time to move so I just gave two months notice Uh, I'll say for this podcast I timed it to be November 1st so I wouldn't have to do New Year's Eve inventory (laughs) uh, which I know most most industries don't understand but on this podcast everybody will and uh, Paul, not knowing I had given notice in one of those wonderful coincidences of life, which sometimes work out, uh, called me like two or three days later, and he didn't know I was already leaving. And he said, hey, man, there's this little building coming open near the fish market. It's about a block away. Uh, he had grown up in Detroit, like I said, where you could get good deli food. And in Chicago, where I grew up, you could get it, but you couldn't get it in Ann Arbor. And that was one of the things we had talked about doing. And so somehow, I don't know how, but like within a week, we decided we would do it. And then four and a half months later, we were open. Uh, today, it takes, you know, as you can relate to, I'm sure about four months to get a meeting set up where everybody's <laughs> not booked or out of town or whatever. Uh, but uh, somehow we renovated the space, uh, did the menu, costed, wrote the recipes, costed the recipes, and we opened up March 15th, 1982. It's, original space was 1300 square feet the building had built been built in 1902 as a grocery uh, it's a little two-story orange brick building on on a kind of diagonal i think it's hexagonal we shaped uh intersection so it's, it has a funny in an interesting way uh building shape and we had 29 seats 25 sandwiches on the menu and a little bit of what's now well known as specialty food but uh at the time was mostly just considered weird I, you know, people, if I would tell them we had extra virgin olive oil, the standard response was something along the lines of like, extra virgin, like, how can that be? (laughs) So, you know, obviously, the food world has come quite a long ways. Yes. Uh, But our original vision uh, was not written down the way we now do it. But as I told the story in the new pamphlet, I mean, we had one in our heads, like, as as does everybody who opens something with a with a dream, whether it's a nonprofit or they start a, a band or a, a church or whatever they care about, they they've imagined this future, and that's basically what a vision is. So we knew from the get go we only wanted one. Uh, I I like unique things. I I did a pamphlet a few years ago called The Art of Business. I'm I'm much more interested in the originals. Uh, in the food world, I've always been drawn to the places where there's one. Like it's just yeah. the places like I think of Cal Pep in Barcelona. Uh, I, you know, we're like, I go there. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's certainly not perfect. Nothing is, 
but it's a really special place that 20, 30, 40 years later, like I still remember going there and I still want to go back. Um, and no disrespect to those who choose to open multiple units. I think it's easy, clearly a good, potentially good business model. It's just not interesting to me. Uh, we knew we wanted great food, great service, and great place for people to work. We knew from the get-go we wanted to do it, as we still do in a very down-to-earth way. We weren't interested in being like really, you know, up here. We wanted people of all walks of life uh, who were interested in food. And obviously, there's financial barriers, but that that's an issue that we all struggle with. But beyond that, we wanted it to be as accessible to anybody who was interested, whether it was a high school student from next door or next to the uh, alternative high school to come in and get a slice of bread and some butter, or, or it was somebody coming from, you know, the, the president of the university or somebody flying in from New York City to have lunch, whatever. We wanted them all to be welcome, et cetera. And from the beginning, we wanted something really just unique and special, like not a copy of what already existed in New York or, or wherever, we wanted something that was going to be true to us. So that was our original vision. I'll say from the get-go, uh, mostly people thought we were nuts. Uh, everybody said we'd be out of business within a year or two. You know, as you said, the industry is not easy anyway. Uh, people told us it was a bad neighborhood. There's still no parking to this day. Uh, <laughs> Many people Parking. listening will not be able to remember when they didn't have a map on their phone yeah. to help them navigate everything. But there's a lot of weird one way streets, which made it very difficult for out of town people to find it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So and and then also we were doing a lot of weird stuff in the industry like we had like now it's normal to have retail and restaurant in one space. But at the time, it was almost unheard of. So people in either camp thought we were crazy for including the other <laughs> the retail uh, camp and yeah. the restaurant camp yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it was just like are you nuts why would you want to do that and then and then also we from the beginning we had this traditional jewish food which we still have all the stuff you already know chicken soup corned beef you know etc chopped liver but but we also we never tried to be only jewish so we had ham hocks because we were opening in the in the old african-american neighborhood we had prosciutto we had things that my mother was freaking out about <laughs> because they weren't uh things that i should have been eating and so we combined those two things also in a way that was quite pretty unusual fast forwarding now to 41 years in march down the road uh and a couple of written visions which is where all of this came from we have a series of businesses you mentioned the we call it zingerman's community of businesses all located here in the ann arbor area uh, we operate as one organization with these semi-autonomous pieces so it's not it wasn't just me and paul investing in different operations and quotes it's really run as one organization uh, with a, a lot of freedom and autonomy within each business uh, there's managing partners within each business so this is somebody who's on site regularly uh, not just a manager, no offense to managers, because there's some great managers in the world, probably some yeah. listening, but but in general, when there's an owner on site, it's a different, I, I think, energy when it's done well and a different experience. And and uh, we have today uh, the bake, Zingerman's Bakehouse, uh, Zing Train, where I'm sitting now, our mail order, which started rather organically by people moving out of town and calling once a week somebody would call and try to buy something now it's our biggest business uh, we ship food and 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 uh whatever olive oil bread pastry cheese from our creamery etc all over the country we have a little creamery where we make handmade cream cheese so old school which hardly anybody does uh fresh goat cheese gelato we have a coffee roasting a candy manufacturer where we make handmade candy bars we have an amazing little uh, Korean restaurant. Uh, Ji Hae Kim is the partner there and the chef, and she's done uh, incredible work with uh, traditional regional Korean food. Zingerman's Roadhouse is all regional American food, uh, which is going to have its 20th anniversary in September. Let's see what else. Cornman Farms is a 1830s barn and farmhouse that we renovated, and we do weddings and events out there. It's about 15, 10 minutes west of town uh zingerman's food tours so we take people to europe right now maybe we'll soon we'll expand from there to visit people that we buy from and really have a food and wine experience uh in in the, in the origin in the place that the food and wine originate from and uh 
feel like I'm forgetting something, but that's a that's a rough scope. So we have about 750 people that work in the organization. Wow. <clears throat> uh, the total sales will be this past year, our fiscal year ends the end of July, 70 million. Wow. And then we have just to wrap up this piece. So we run the organization by consensus of the managing partners. So that's like 18 or 19 people. So not the price of a sandwich at the deli or which toast special goes on the menu at the coffee company that's decided in each business. But like if we're going to open a new Zingram's business or change our three steps to great service to four steps, that would be approved at the what we call the partners group level. And then we're moving more and more. <clears throat> excuse me, towards employee ownership. So we have 225, 230 staff own a share right now. Wow. That's great. Can you bring me back to going from Zingerman's to your, your, the second business? Cause I think a lot of people that listen to this show and one of the things like we said in our, in our thesis is, is how do we think differently as food businesses? And the thing I love about your food, food business is that it's, it's evolved over time. And it's yeah. also, it's also the tortoise. It's not the hare. Everyone yeah. loves, everyone loves to celebrate the hare, the unicorn, all the things that, that we see and get celebrated typically in the press, but yeah. what doesn't get celebrated is the craft. You know, we're, yeah. we're in the barbecue business, the low and slow business and yeah. you're, you're low and slow tortoise. Um, but you also had to get to two. How'd you get, how'd yeah. you get to the second business? Yeah. People often will say like, man, you're growing so fast. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I'm not a math major and I'm not a finance major, but it's sort of like your 401k. If you just keep putting a little in every year over four years, it interest. looks like a lot. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, most years we've grown, I don't know, five, six, eight, nine percent, you know, which is like a reasonable growth rate. So I, I look at the growth and I look at organizations and I've written quite a bit and it'll be uh, the next book, <clears throat> as I carve out time in my spare time, uh, be the next book will be on this metaphorical model of organizational ecosystem. So if you think of nature, uh, I learned many years ago from uh, Miller, Joe Lindley uh, down in uh, North Carolina. He's seventh generation. I'm sure his kids are in there now. So it's probably eighth generation. And I was walking around. He was, we were buying some grain from him. And he goes, one thing I learned nothing good ever happens in a hurry. And I was like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really true. And I obviously on a tiny scale and from a mindfulness standpoint, and it, you know, there's beauty and joy in the butterfly landing on the, on the, on the leaf or whatever. But in terms of big things happening in nature in a hurry, they're all bad. <laughs> it's true. a, it's Very a tornado. True. It's a hurricane. It's a flood. It's an earthquake. And so it's really trying to grow in a way that's more aligned with nature and that doesn't take over the ecosystem. And there's some uh, businesses that we can leave their names out or I can say them, but where their growth is huge and everybody looks at them as this massive success, but I look at them as an invasive species. Like it's, yeah, the growth is super high, <laughs> but the question is what's left in the ecosystem after they've eaten yep. everything right so just like the whatever it was that the carp that got into lake michigan and you know they're not native and yeah if you if you judge their their success on growth rate i'll leave the swear words out but they're killing it yeah right but if you look at what they're doing to the lake ecosystem it's really not that great and so the second business for us was sort of was the was the bakehouse uh it was done as we were already starting the conversations that became the first time we wrote a vision which was Zinc called Zingerman's 2009 that we wrote in 1994 so intuitively we sort of had the sense that we then made much clearer when we wrote the vision but already it was clear to, to us that like just continuing to grow the deli it's just it makes it harder and harder to do what you do really well. And so yeah. rather than adding a baking department, and the reason we were interested in baking, by the way, is because we were frustrated that we couldn't get the quality level that we were wanted and from other bakeries. So it wasn't like we wanted to go into the bakery business yeah. as this big economic opportunity. It was like we kept trying to work with these bakeries to improve what we had thought was good in 1982. But as I traveled, realized wasn't good enough. 
and they never would change really and so it, eventually i just was like screw it we're going to open our own and i don't know how but we're going to figure this out and so we set up the bakehouse as a separate business and again we wanted a partner in there so frank had been the line cook uh in the in the restaurant been a partner in the fish market whatever and he agreed to uh, thankfully for all of us to be the managing partner in there and started to study baking and uh and so that's how the bakehouse got going and originally it was really just wholesaling to the deli uh <clears throat> and grew from there uh and today again it's a very it's a wonderful business thanks to frank's work to amy emberling who was one of the original bakers who became a partner uh eight years later uh to jason restrick who started at like 17 working in the shop who's now a managing partner also um and everybody who's worked over there it's it's become one of the best bakeries in the country and and so that was number two what i would say is if you ask me now what i would do it's it's always to start with a vision um because there's really no right answer for the future and there's no wrong answer i just wrote a piece in the e-news uh, that i do which i'm assuming you'll throw in the show notes absolutely the, definitely we'll put in the show so I, I just wrote yesterday again about the visioning process because it's really changed my life i wouldn't be sitting here with you with do having this conversation without it it's a very different you know to your point about going in against the grain it's a completely different way to work uh it's a very inside out process in other words it's your art it's not what you could do it's what you want to do right and so if you want to grow as to be giant awesome do it but do it because it feels right to you and because yeah. it's how you believe you want to show up in the world but just growing because your cousin grows and Elon Musk grew and <laughs> the Wall Street Journal told you about some superstar growth business is a, not a great reason any more than letting your mother design your life for you uh <laughs> she, she has opinions some of which are helpful and some of which aren't and you could decide how much you want to follow them but when you just follow them because she told you to do it it leads to some really severe life crises later right and so this is really when you write the vision the way we do it you're describing the future you want and it's coming from the heart and it's it's including facts and feelings so it's not just a business plan it's 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 also about how you feel about your work how do the people you work with feel about well, you <laughs> how does your community feel about you etc so i i was very fortunate that i never met my father i was raised by my grandfather and he was from mm -hmm. the old country from bulgaria and he was mm -hmm. obsessed with learning obsessed with reading obsessed mm -hmm. with curiosity and asking questions yeah um, so much like of a great guy yeah he, so much of what he taught me was that we not only need to learn and be curious but also share what we learn yeah. and the more that we share what we learn the bigger impact that we can make I mean it's the reason yeah. why I'm having this conversation with you is selfishly I could have reached out to you coordinated this and you know figured out a way to get some of your time to to hear about you know it's, this incredible it's not hard business. I'll give out my email on <laughs> but it's Ari, that's it's that's 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 the beauty of the world that we live in is that we all have this access we have access unfettered access I can't imagine what my grandfather what he was able to accomplish without the internet now we have the internet um can you talk about zing train and yeah, the evolution sure. of of the impact of this open book philosophy this leadership um philosophy that you are now taking beyond Ann Arbor literally to anyone yeah well uh Yes, well, open book management is one piece of of what we do. It's it's certainly not the only one. But Zing Train. So when we in 1994 uh, we wrote the what we came to call the Zingerman's 2009 vision. So we this was 15 years into the future, and that's where we for the first time described uh, having this community of businesses like a just uh, talked about earlier where we would have these managing partners where each business was a Zingerman's business but each had its unique specialty so that we didn't replicate the deli where they would all be here in the Ann Arbor area uh, as per what I said earlier and where it would operate as I described as one organization with these semi-autonomous pieces so that's what we laid out and one of the great things the many great things about having an inspiring vision that you share is that good people are drawn to it right people who share your values so the people who wanted to be part of an organization that was going to flip and make millions of dollars on stock options would not be drawn to that to the vision we wrote which is not a judgment 
of them, but it's just, it, it helps you to self-select because if we didn't have that vision, it would be very easy to make up a story and somebody said, man, these guys are going to go, they're going to go crazy. I'm going to get in there. And, and then later they would be super frustrated with us because we weren't going to go public and they weren't going to flip and get all this money. But the good news is the people who share those values and share that vision, again, not good or bad, just the ones who share the vision of the future are drawn to it. So Maggie Bayless, I mentioned, had been a cocktail waitress at uh, the restaurant when I started, uh, when I was a line cook and Paul was whatever managing. And uh, she had been a German lit major from Oberlin College, uh, which you'll appreciate. And then she had ended up here. Long story short, she ended, decided later to go back and she did get her MBA uh, in Michigan. And she went to work at GM for long enough uh, as she says, to find out it wasn't where she wanted to work a couple of years. Uh, and she left there and went to work for a small consulting firm in town here. And it was equally dysfunctional. She learned just smaller. Uh, but she, the good news is while she was there, she really became passionate about training. And so in the same way I'm passionate about the food, uh, she became passionate about training systems. And so when we shared this 2009 vision, she came to me and Paul and she said, well, what about starting, you know, you've written this vision for other Zingerman's businesses existing. What about making one of them a training business that will, uh, will help to sort of solidify the training work? help to keep the training healthy within the organization and then also we could uh, offer it uh, sell it etc to the outside world so that's really where zinc train started uh, was her essentially her vision it started in 1994 so we're coming up on 30 years of zinc train uh, and what we do through zinc we don't really do consulting what we do is is training to your grandfather's uh, perspective we're sharing what we do so we certainly uh, go off site and do it too. But the core of the work uh, up until the pandemic, at least, was essentially people coming here for in person seminars. And then it's evolved also to where we go off site. I was just in Arizona doing uh, vision facilitation for a group there. Um, and so we, you know, I keynote and other people keynote and stuff, at, like you said, in all those venues that people name. Uh, and, and essentially, we're just teaching our approach to visioning, our approach to servant leadership, our approach to, uh, to management, our approach to open book management that you talked about, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's really, again, a very special business. And again, Maggie's vision from the beginning was not to be this giant consulting firm and be the McKinsey of the food world and have, you know, seven floors in an office building. Not that that's bad. It's just her vision was to keep it in this kind of small, very special place. I'd love to talk about humility and, mm -hmm. uh, and hospitality in, in particular. In one of your mm -hmm. pamphlets, you wrote about a quote from Mozart is that the music is not in the notes, but in the silence in between. Yeah. I love it. So do I. Let's have a moment of silence. Um, yeah, I mean, humility. So in this ecosystem metaphor, uh, which is a whole, probably another podcast in and of itself, which I'm happy to do. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have multiple shows. We, we okay, can book I'm you happy again. to do more. But anyway, I started to look at humility as what it actually, in this case, was an easy connection because humility comes from humus top which is topsoil so humility is like the topsoil of the organization as it erodes which is by the way happening in the real ecosystem too through our human mismanagement uh, but as hum as as topsoil erodes it's harder and harder to have health in the ecosystem i mean and and eventually you get desertification uh and that's what happens, I think, in organizations too. Uh, humility is an essential ingredient. Everybody, you see, you know, Patrick Lencioni's book on uh, whatever it's called, Ideal Team Player, which is great. And he focuses on humble, hungry, and smart. I mean, it's, it's a common theme. It's just missing. <laughs> and then to your point about people are encouraged to have this massive growth, they're also encouraged getting the belief, getting the story told to them over and over that their success comes from fame, fortune, being on the cover of fortune. And 
I'm not saying those are bad. And, you know, we all have egos. I have one too. And I like a compliment too. I mean, it's not like I don't care, but it's, it's when we're coming from a place of humbleness, which is how I've come to look at it more than humility, which is they're essentially the same, but humbleness for me makes it more of a mindset, like mindfulness rather than a characteristic or trait. It's a practice. But anyway, uh, my humbleness means that we're neither too high nor too low. So most people will know instinctively or from experience that humility, humbleness means we're not really full of ourselves, but it also means that we're not really down on ourselves. And and both are equally important. And so it means that we're treating ourselves with dignity, that we honor who we are in our own imperfect reality of, of existence. Uh, and we remember it's never all about us. We're not that powerful. Uh, and it's tricky to do when we're in a in a world that promotes the people who are full of themselves. Yes. Uh, and and that, you know, but when ego becomes more important than the ecosystem, we're in trouble and i i don't it's not hard to find that i mean i i i don't know it was a year and a half ago a friend of mine who is more connected in the political world than i am uh and she's you know this was in one of the worst i would say as a history person times of american history politically and she's like if i were going to give a message to political leaders of both parties what small businesses want what should I tell them? And I'm like, okay, that's a fair question. Let me think about it. And I, I, I know my answer was not one she expected, but it was humility. That's what I want. <laughs> because if you had humbleness, a lot of problems go away. Russia doesn't invade Ukraine. Without getting into who one should vote for, you don't have January 6th. Uh, Racism goes away because nobody's better than anybody else. Patriarchy, whatever you want to call it, I'm not judging anybody, but it goes away because you're not better because you're X, Y, or Z, right? And you're not worse either. And so a lot of the problems that we're having go away and, and the struggles of climate crisis, climate change goes away too because we're, we understand that we're only one small part of, a, of an ecosystem we're not in charge. Yeah. And, and so a lot of issues would be, it doesn't mean life would be easy. It doesn't mean we'd be problem free. It doesn't mean Nirvana or, you know, utopia would arrive, but it's just a lot of the, the things that are challenging the world in very bad ways would be diminished. It's, it's a great conversation. And you think, I think of the juxtaposition of when I think of story and I think of our story, um, I'm a big fan of Cal Newport's uh, be so good. They can't ignore you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you build a, a great foundation, eventually, you know, they asked Steve Martin, it was, it was based off of a quote. They asked Steve, Steve Martin, how he became such a great comedian. And mm -hmm. he said, I'm going to tell you an answer that most people won't want to hear. And it's be so great. They can't ignore you. And that gets to the, to the craft, you know, the mm -hmm. craft of, of the artist. And you focus a lot on the artist and the, mm -hmm. you know, the businesses that you're creating um, for me personally, we were we thought that if we created a great business a barbecue business in san diego and provided mm -hmm. incredible exceptional hospitality took care of our yep. community gave back that people sounds, were come sounds and, about right yeah that people were going to come and line up and, and knock down our doors and build this incredible business and when i realized that wasn't the case is once i started utilizing the internet to start telling our story uh -huh. so for you i'm asking to the zingermans to the entire ecosystem mm -hmm. is there a fun fundamental way that you approach social media in this day and age and is there a way that you're going to get louder on all the different platforms because you have such a powerful message because there there is that ego that we're talking about and there is that humility and back to mozart's quote is how do you be silent when everyone else is loud yeah i'm wrong one to ask about i, I barely go on social media i know I, I i i did my i did my homework you, you're you're on the you've claimed certain profiles but there's no profile i have, photo I have well, I no have content a, i have an instagram account so i can look at other people's uh if i want like my girlfriend who's does who's very good at it 
um, and look at ours. But and I so it's not like I never look at it. It's sure. just not my number one priority. Uh, sure. I I prefer to read and write and. I'm not judging. I mean, there's clearly great stuff that happens on social media. Uh, Tammy, my significant other, uses it to rescue dogs and do some amazing work and connect with friends. And she's never, she doesn't post critical things. She's very positive and there's a lot of great stuff has come from it. And at the same time, we know that there's some downsides like everything, right? So yep. everything can have its, has its upsides and its downsides. I, I mean, I, it's really just a tool, I guess, is how I look at it. And there's always been social media, like going to the tavern was social media. Correct. Right. So it's it's just another way of word of mouth. And the the difference is that it can be. There's a so as an essay, you probably know, in in part one of the book that I did called Natural Laws of Business. And one of them is that strengths lead to weaknesses. So yes. whatever you're good at. Uh, will, if you follow the continuum along, inevitably, by nature, lead to what you're not good at. So we know that what's the upside of social media, man, you can reach all kind of people so fast. And so, you know, it's, it's awesome. What's the downside? You could reach all kind of people <laughs> so fast. And so we're, I can't remember who I learned it from. And I apologize for not being able to give credit, but just that Technologic major technological changes, whether it's the printing press or the web, uh, that it takes, I don't know, a couple, 10, 20 years, 30 years before the social implications are really yeah. felt. And I, I, it makes sense to me, and I'm not taking credit for making this up at all, but it, like if you look at what's going on in the country right now, uh, if you look at what's going on in the world, we're feeling the negative implications and no one's come up with yet the ways sure. to manage it more effectively. So what the, I, I'm due to write a piece for the e-news about the ecosystem in our heads, because we all have one. Yeah. And just like in farming, like if you, if you throw a lot of industrial waste on your soil, it's not going to go well. <laughs> uh, and so you know, I'm not saying I've never looked at something unproductive, but if you if you if one spends a lot of time with anger, violence, negativity, it's impossible for that not to reproduce within our inner ecosystem. And yeah. it doesn't make you a bad person. It's just it's like if what you eat is not good, not healthful, it's hard to be healthy. And I know there's like one in a hundred or one in a thousand that eats at McDonald's every day and smokes a pack of cigarettes and drinks whiskey all night and they're still going fine, but it's not the norm. And so the more I'm surrounded in my ecosystem by, you know, here's the books I'm carrying with me right now. Charles Eisenstein's book on sacred economics, uh, my friends who I've never met, but through the upside of the web, I know, which is uh Ebeli Toth and Dub Zane are in Uganda and do some amazing work with anarchism and indigenous stuff. And we've connected over email and it's yep. awesome. I just emailed with them the other day. Uh, and I've got a book uh, uh, from Dr. Keltner uh, on the good life. I just started reading, which is reaffirming all this. You know, so it's, it's just like who you put into your head, who you listen to, who you yeah. spend time with. And if I look at what's out there in the social ecosystem, and if I'm, you know, I went to movies as a kid too, but if mostly you're seeing people killing each other, mostly you're seeing the opposite of humility, mostly you're seeing, and then with social media and all these log, uh, algorithms, we know like it's not rocket science and I'm not the expert in the least, but it's clearly just feeding you more of the same thing. So yeah. like, and I, even if I listen to some of it for five minutes, it's hard not to believe it. Like, yeah. I know it's not right. I know it's not true. It goes against my values. I'm pretty moderately intelligent and I've been doing this for a long time, but even five to 10 minutes of listening to the same story about X person's the, the devil or whatever. Like sure. it's hard not to believe it. And if you're surrounded by that repeatedly for years, dude, <laughs> the root system of your beliefs is just getting deeper and deeper. So, well, I, I guess I could be I'm good. Just, 
and it can go bad. I'm just challenging you that because of your powerful message and the way that you're making an impact, yeah. you're actually creating content that can be consumed by anybody that needs yeah. to be on the internet. Just yeah. like you said, it's not on the internet. And the more that your message and the message of all the artisans within Ann Arbor and these ecosystems of businesses yeah. We're, we're out there. We could do better, but that's why I'm on your podcast. And <laughs> as, as I Maggie, guess I'm just trying to inspire you to, to get on more platforms because I believe in the message. The more that I've, I've read your work, the more that I've listened to you, the more that I know, you know, the power, I believe in the power of the good of the internet. Obviously, yeah. yes, there's the, there's yeah, the clearly. bad, yeah. um, but, but back to my grandfather, knowing that my grandfather was literally have to travel to a different village in Bulgaria because he yeah. read every book in that village. Yeah. We don't have to do that if yeah. leaders like you have the courage to do the things that you're doing right now, which is come on this show, continue to give speeches and repurpose yeah. words, images, videos onto the internet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, we're out there. I mean, I do this e-news every week. Please sign I've, up. The e news that'll turn into a podcast. Well, you never know. I just like you <laughs> it'll said, turn like into a YouTube the other channel. way. So, like, <laughs> when everybody has one, doesn't matter if everybody has one. Well, it does. What matters is you. What matters is what you told me in the beginning was uniqueness. Right. So I'm not saying it's bad or good or bad. It's just there's only so many hours, and that, yep. you know, it's But you're already better. doing it, right? You're already well, doing it. I am, but I'm letting you have the podcast and then I'll let you promote it and you like it. And I, I'd rather sit, you know, I like working the floor at the restaurant uh, yep. and I like, I like the writing, right. And the two together, you know, create a meaningful life for me. So I'm, I'm not opposed to any of that. I mean, it's just figuring out which things are both rewarding for me because I need to want to do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and feel good about it because that's what enriches my internal ecosystem and gives me that sure positive energy to be excited to work every day and to want to keep going and to stay up late working on stuff. Cause I want to do it, not cause I yeah. have to do it. Yes. And, and that, you know, what's right for one person is not right for the other one. So like I, I run every day, like I'm super slow. I'm an afternoon runner. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not competitive. I've never run an organized race. I have no interest in it. I like being alone. It's, it's great. You know, other people hate running. Like it's not like running's the answer. It's just finding a thing that works for you and then doing it in a way that helps you live the life you want to live. And part of that's financial and part of that's whatever, but you know, trying to do the stuff that is interesting to me. <laughs> So well, that I, I want to keep doing it. I appreciate that. And we're we're grateful for all the people that that listen to the show, that watch the show. Um, every single Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, we're on the social audio app Clubhouse. Um, that's an opportunity if you listen to the show to raise your hand, come up on the virtual stage and tell us the story of your hospitality journey, um, no matter where you are in the hospitality space. If you're an owner, operator, multi-unit, if you're a manager, if you're a server, no matter what you are, come up on stage, tell us about what you're doing um, online and how we can help. Uh, this week, I'm going to give a social shout out and that goes to Joe Martinez. He has just opened up his first uh, food truck business, Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue, and um, he has a YouTube channel with over 200,000 subscribers. He's on TikTok, Instagram. He's doing all the things to tell the story of his business. Eventually, we'll be doing mail order, hopefully a global company like Zingerman's. Um, but Ari, is there somebody in the organization, since this is an entrepreneur, that yeah. you'd like to give a special shout out to that's gone above and beyond in uh, 2022, heading into 2023? Well, I think everybody, to be honest, and I'm not being flip. I mean, it's... I, I, you know, humility dictates like whatever I have done, it, it wouldn't, I mean, I'm not just saying this, it, it, there's no, like, I wouldn't be here without all these other people. Yeah. And it's not just a figure of speech or a nice thing to say. I mean, it's just the reality. Like if Paul wouldn't have changed my beliefs about business 40, whatever years ago, I would never have been in business. Uh, you know, if Frank wouldn't have taught me how to cook the line all those years ago, I wouldn't, you know, if Maggie wouldn't have started Zinc Train. And then it's just, you know, really, honestly, whatever we've achieved or whatever recognition we get in the end of the day, like, who cares? Yeah. You know, if the if the espresso across 
from where I'm sitting at the coffee company is lousy or we give you bad service at the door at the roadhouse when you come in tonight like like maybe we get an extra pass because we've been around for a while but we're all just a year from going out of business I mean yeah. and I don't mean that in a like scary horrible way it's just the reality and I don't take any of it for granted and I don't take anybody for granted and it's really going out every day and you know same as you i mean it's it's go out and re-earn it man and to go yeah. taste check the salt you know and and you know check the crust on the baguette and not that a, a dozens of other people here aren't doing it too i'm not saying i'm so great but it's just that all of us need to be on that all the time and i i guess for me it's just i, I deeply appreciate everybody here it's you know like i said whatever 18 19 managing partners uh, I didn't mention we have four staff partners that serve two-year terms as wow. part of that consensus. Uh, and and really, the newest person we just hired is already doing stuff that's helping to keep the organization going. And I take that seriously. And and, and I feel like, in a good way, I have a, a deep responsibility to help get them to greatness. Because if they're all getting to greatness, it's it, the organization's going to be doing really great. So I don't, I'm so, happy to I'm happy to read all 700 names, but I don't think you have to take up, to take <laughs> so up the So when when somebody visits Ann Arbor and they go to Zingerman's for the first yeah. time, what do they order? Well, it depends which part of the organization they go to because <laughs> part of, part of in a good way what's happening. Well, let's go to the original. We want to go so to the original. Go to the, the deli. First, what do you order? Deli. Is you should order what you want to eat. But yes, uh, the Reuben, of course, is the biggest selling thing. I would order, which I can answer more accurately if I had never been there. Uh, the number one sandwich, which is chopped liver and corned beef. Uh, so that would be a good way to go. Uh, and then I would taste like a lot of all the stuff. So we have everything open to taste. You want to taste any of the cheeses, uh, the olive oils, the breads, whatever, please come taste uh, and experience as much as you can. There's an incredible orange blossom honey from Italy that just came in. The e-news that I do every week in part is, is putting stuff out there that people will not have known about. We got uh, just started getting in some incredible sumac from Jordan uh woman-owned company there that's wonderful uh spice uh and then i wrote the week before about uh they call it honeycomb but it's not really honeycomb so it's essentially spun honey uh that's then dipped in chocolate and it comes from dubai uh wow a company called mirzam and it's it's a bitter honey uh, like the corbezzo loaf from uh from sardinia at, that's barely sweet and then it's dipped in dark chocolate and so it's sort of like seafoam candy texture you know so it's just there's so many things and even with all the travel it's still amazing to be able to bring people these tastes of yes flavors that yeah you know it, like at the roadhouse we do barbecue also and fried chicken and macaroni and so it's it's not like that's the only place in the country you can get fried chicken I mean it's just you know i'm not that competitive and so when people start going and is it as good i'm like i just want it to be the best fried chicken you're going to have today and i just yes. want you to have a really amazing meal right and whether it's better than so and so's grandmother i like whatever it's not an issue because she's not here tonight and you're not at her house having her cook for you so let's just make this a great dinner and everybody's going to go home happy where is the best place for people that want to read your work? Your your yeah. So we're this, this we're, amazing uh, this amazing writing career that came out of uh, turning yeah. turning the restaurant newsletter and taking it yeah. over. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in this food world, I can say it with clear understanding: we're essentially farm to table, but for books. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of Amazon. No disrespect. Uh, we do all the work here. Uh, yes you know of course we have editors and proofers that we hire and stuff i don't mean we're so egotistical that we don't need help but the point is to do the production in-house so that yep. we can choose the paper that they're on we choose where the line breaks go because it makes a difference in your reading experience uh, we choose the colors so that it fits the what the look we want etc and then we print them all here in town and 
So the easiest place is zingermanspress.com okay. uh, or zingtrain.com. Or if they're in town, they're in the businesses. And if I'm around, I'd be honored to sign them. And uh, there's four parts in the business book series. By part five is in the works, but it's, it still takes a little a while, as you know. Um, but part one is mostly about our organizational stuff. So a lot about the visioning work, et cetera. Part two on leadership. So servant leadership, we do a lot of work around energy management, which I learned from my friend Anise Cavanaugh, who you could have on the podcast. She's not really yes. in the food business, but Absolutely. Great, great interview. Uh, part three is on self-management, which I'm sure no one listening actually needs, but maybe one of your staff needs some help <laughs> with that one. Uh, and then part four uh, is about beliefs. So this has been a huge piece of our work uh, over the last four or five years, which is getting clarity around what beliefs are. So not religion, sports, and politics, but like what you believe about human beings, what you believe about young people, what you believe about coffee or barbecue or the ecosystem or whatever, and how that we have the power to choose the beliefs that we had and how our beliefs are being formed like yours in a wonderful way formed in so positively from your grandfather's influence, but it's not genetic. Yes. Uh, and, and understanding those beliefs and that we can choose them. And 18 months ago, we rolled out a statement of beliefs, which is our commitment basically that these are the, in essence, intellectual ingredients we will use for our decision making and that's been a big thing and then there's a bunch of pamphlets up there some are single uh, essays out of the books like the single off the album for people who don't want the whole leadership book they could just read about servant leadership but then there's six that are not in the books also and uh one of them the most recent one is on more on visioning uh there's the one on emma goldman who i don't know if your grandfather would have known about but she was from lithuania came oh, wow. to the u.s in 18 uh 85 when she was 16 years old uh she was an anarchist and by the time she was 20 uh to your point about venue your question about venues she was speaking to audiences of like 5,000 people by the time she was 20 21 wow. years old and of course she was like five feet tall and if you think back to 1880 or 19 1890 I mean if it was 5,000 people it was 96 percent were men so yes. you have this five foot tall 21-year-old wow. woman talking to audiences of 5,000, 3,000, 6,000 men. Amazing. Uh, and, and J. Edgar Hoover called her the most dangerous woman in America, but I just think she was ahead of her time. So anyway, but and then there's the one on humility. There's one on working through hard times, which was about getting through the pandemic. Uh, there's uh, one on bottom line change, which is our organizational change process, which or recipe, which I really recommend for people. And last but not least is the art of business one I mentioned, which is my belief that business and life are like music or art or poetry. And there you go. I love and it. And then the e-news, you'll put the link in there, but people yes. can sign up and it comes out uh, our time, four o'clock on Wednesday afternoons. I love it. Well, um, yeah, if you guys want to keep in touch with me, it's Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. Um, we will put links in the show notes so you can connect with Ari, his uh, his writings, uh, zingermans.com. Please go and check that out. You can find them on Instagram at Zingerman's Deli. Uh, Ari, it's truly been an honor. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for your abundance of, of giving. Um, for your leadership, for your willingness to share your vision, uh, not just with us and our audience, but continuing to do it, um, making an impact, making Ann Arbor a place that is is now circled on my destinations to to come and visit, to see the magic out, in man. person. Direct yeah, so flight on direct Delta, flight. San Diego <laughs> to Detroit. There we go. Um, any uh, any quotes that are you're pondering? Any recent quotes that you're pondering? Any parting words of wisdom on belief there's, systems? There's, for, always, there's, for, there's always quotes, but I there's, I, there's like always quotes. quotes. But I, I didn't uh, weren't prepared to, I, I, to I caught you, you quote, off guard. But I can find you a quote. Uh, let me get one from Emma Goldman here. We're just gonna lower the the, the computer screen by taking out one of the books. How's that? There we go. Very practical. We're going to flip to this page because this quote is really a lot of what uh, helped me to reconnect my studies of anarchism from when I was in school with uh, with what uh, 
we were doing in the workplace. And so she wrote this in 1910 and she wrote it about anarchism. But when I read it, reread it, I don't know, 10 years ago, I was like, this is what we're trying to do in the workplace. And I think, Sean, it fits with what you're trying to do, too. She said it's the freest possible expression of all the latent powers of the individual, which is only possible in a state of society where man is free to choose the mode of work, the conditions of work, and the freedom to work. One to whom the making of a table, the building of a house, or the tilling of the soil is what the painting is to the artist and the discovery to the scientist. The result of inspiration, of intense longing, and deep interest in work as a creative force. So I can copy and paste that for you if you want to use wow. it, uh, recreate it. But when I read that, I was like, she wrote this 100 years ago, and it's totally what we're trying to do. And And this is really our work, to your point, is like, how do we... Not how do we become famous, but how do no. we make every new line cook feel like their work is a creative force in their life and that it has meaning and purpose and that they matter as a human being and that we they're treated with dignity and that their voice makes a difference. And if we do that and the food's good and the service is good because they also have to be done well and the finances managed effectively, then we can keep going. And we can keep going. I don't want Our, to have to apply for a job again. I've never written a resume. <laughs> uh, Ari, it's been truly an honor. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time, your wisdom. We can't wait to, to come out and visit. Um, please subscribe to the show. Please visit uh, zingermans.com. Uh, please just literally this has been such an honor. Um, this is, I, I told you when we started the show, this is why um, I love the opportunity that we have to have conversations like these, because I think it's it's so important, not just in the hospitality business, but in all business, um, that we start to lead with love. We start to lead with story. We get back to the craft of what we do um, and understand that, you know, that this is, a, it's a marathon and it's not a sprint. And we should celebrate the, the long and hard work that we do every single day, um, because it, it can be magical work. Absolutely. And uh, again, my email is Ari at Zingermans.com. So people are welcome to reach out. And uh, like you said, Zingermans.com is all the food. So we'd love to ship everybody food too. There you go. And then the books and stuff, Zingerman's Press uh, or Zingtrain.com. And love to, love to, whatever, if people have questions, please reach out. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. And we will catch you guys next week. Thank you. Thanks, John. Take care. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. I will get you the link to the right Toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about Toast, you implemented Toast, you did a Toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your Toast story with us. DM me today to learn more and be sure to check out Toast.